Welcome to EPG Partshala. I am V. Selva Kumar, faculty in the Department of Maritime History and Marine Archaeology, Tamil University, Tanjavur. Today, we are going to look into the subject of Indian culture. Under this subject, we have a paper, Economic History of India up to 1707. Under this particular paper, we are going to look into the economy of uh, the Sangam age in South India. We are going to look into the various aspects of the economy of the Sangam age. Actually, this refers to the period be between roughly 300 BCE to 300 CE in the region of Tamil Nadu and Kerala. So, we will be looking into the various aspects of economy here. Learning objectives. Knowing about the Sangam age and early historic period, understanding the economy of the Sangam age, acquiring knowledge about the inland trade, knowing about the Indian Ocean trade. These are the learning objectives of this particular lesson. Before going into the economic aspects of Sangam age, we should know what is Sangam age. The Sangam age is actually the period between 3rd century BCE to 3rd century CE. The literature called Sangam text in Tamil are available for this period. The literature has references to the ways of life and the economic activities of the people. It is an important source material for this cultural period. The evidence from literature is corroborated by Tamil inscription, Ashokan inscription, Greco-Roman sources and archaeological evidence. All these sources help us to understand the economy of this particular cultural period. The Sangam age refers to the early historic period in South India. While Tamil scholars refer to this period as Sangam age, Archaeologists refer to the, this as early historic period. Actually, both are referring to the same period. And this term is used for the regions consisting of mainly Kerala and Tamil Nadu in South India. The Iron Age in South India is a formative cultural period and the early historic period succeeded the Iron Age. The Iron Age was characterized by the megalithic burial monuments. The Iron Age is generally placed between 1300 BCE and 300 BCE. After the Iron Age starts the early historic period or Sangam Age which is placed between 300 BCE and 300 CE. The polity of the Sangam Age was dominated by the Vendors or higher level uh, political chiefs known as the Chodas, the Pandyas and the Cheras and there were several other small political entities occupying the various regions of Tamilakam. Sangam texts, they are the main source for the uh, understanding of this particular region and cultural period. We have 18 major works known as uh, collection of uh, Ettu Tohai or 8 uh, anthologies and then Pattu Pattu or 10 long poems. They help us to understand the cultural way of life of the people. These poems are mainly secular in nature and they men mention about the day-to-day -day activities of the people in a very great detail. So, the, these details are actually corroborated by archaeological evidence. If we look at the archaeological evidence independently, we may not understand the evidences completely. So, we need to corroborate the archaeological evidence as well as literary text to understand the, uh, understand the cultural period holistically. The landscape and economic activities. The, actually, uh, the uh, early historic period is uh, talked about in elaborate detail by the Sangam literature. The poem actually uses a classification called as thinais. Thinais are actually categories 
and here they talk about five different landscapes called Kurunji, Marudam, Mullai, Neidal, Palai. The ancient Tamilakam was classified into five uh, landscapes and each landscape had a predominant economy that is brought out by the literature. Now, coming to the economic activities of this period, we have evidence for primary production, then we also have evidence for crop production and also commercial activities, both inland and overseas. Coming to the primary production, we have evidence for agriculture, pastoralism, uh, fishing, hunting and gathering in various eco zones or landscapes or thin ice. For craft production, also we have lot of evidence. These basic primary produce and products were exchanged through the commercial activities. The exchanges include local or inland exchanges as well as overseas exchanges. As I mentioned earlier, there are five landscapes mentioned in the text and these landscapes are also real. We can see them if you visit various part of Tamil Nadu and Kerala region. The literature in briefly uh, summarizes the various landscapes and their characteristics. However, we need not take that the uh, information provided by the literature in terms of economy as a strict description. The literature actually highlights the predominant economic mode of a particular zone. It doesn't mean that the people living in that particular economic zone adopted only that particular economy. Kurinji is the mountainous zone that is described in the literature in great detail. It refers to the hill region and it also talks about hilly people. Hunting and gathering was a predominant mode of uh, economy here. People were hunting various animals, gathering various type of food produce and also they were involving in shifting or punam or zoom cultivation in this area. This is brought out by the poems that are related to Kurinji landscapes or Kurinji thinai. Mullai is another landscape which is generally a forested zone with lots, lot of pastures. It was ideally suited for pastoralism, ideally suited for grazing cattle and also sheep goat. And these people were mainly involving in animal husbandry. This was the main production here. Then we have the next landscape called Marudam, which is a riverine zone. Actually, it includes the riverine delta where people were mainly agriculturalists. They were involved in primarily rice cultivation because they had abundant water resources. And then we have Neidal tract, which is a coastal area where we have lot of evidence for fishing, fishing activities. In addition to that, commercial activities were also taking place in this Neidal tract. Finally, another landscape called Palai is mentioned. Palai is described as a very dry land. Again, sometime Palai is a seasonal characteristic of a landscape. In the dry season, especially in the summer, the Mullai region can become Palai because lack of water and high temperature. People living in this particular landscape were doing hunting and gathering and also they were involving in waylaying, actually robbing the travelers as well as merchants who were going through these uh, particular landscape. So this is the description that we are getting about different landscapes. We need not take that whatever described here is a very accurate description. Here the poets used certain convention for their poems by selectively taking certain prominent characteristics of these landscapes. We have to keep that in mind while we interpret the data. But when we look at the archaeological evidence, it more or less uh, goes well with the uh, description in the literature. Again, archaeological evidence throws several other features that are not reflected in the literature. Therefore, to understand this particular period, we need to look at both archaeological 
as well as literary evidence. Kurinji and its uh, economic activities, we will look into this particular landscape in detail. The economic lands, uh, activities of this period was mainly hunting and gathering. They were hunting small games, small animals and they were gathering roots such as sweet potatoes and other uh, produce and they were also involving in small scale farming of millet such as ragi and they were collecting forest fruits like jackfruit, honey and the people were called Kuraman and Kurathir or Vetuvar. They also were involving in agriculture in monsoons because we have certain prom poems mentioning about this particular activity. Uh, they were also cultivating wild variety of paddy which was growing only in the hill uh, region. There is also evidence in Kalithohai, Narchinai and uh, Kurundohai about Thinai rice being cultivated and also we have evidence for wild vari variety of rice grown in this area. People were collecting the forest produce as part of their exchange system. They were collecting pepper, aram which refers to sandal and also ahil which refers to aloe wood. They were collecting from these landscape and then they were exchanging these produce to the people of the other landscape. For example, people who are living in the coastal area, they may not have access to the product of the hill region like honey. Similarly, people from the hilly areas, they may not have access to the dry fish. By exchanging these produce, they could satisfy their basic needs. This was one of the reasons for the development of economy and internal exchange. Actually, the internal exchange developed first and it later on led to the overseas or long distance exchange. Here, they used people very intelligently to collect the resources that are available on the landscape like precious stones and also pepper and so many other valuable spices and they were collected across the landscape and then they were taken to the market. Then the middlemen traded them, they take them to the ports and then from there they were sent to the entire Indian Ocean region. So if you want to understand the entire Indian Ocean trade, you can very well see the pattern that were developing in the Tamil regions. The produce that went from a small village here, probably it reached to various in, uh, Indian Ocean region. What we have here is actually a Indian Ocean trade and exchange network system that developed within which entire India and the Indian Ocean rim became a part of it and goods were freely exchanged and traded across. Mullai is another important uh, cultural region where pastoral people lived. Animal husbandry was the main activity. We have evidence for cowherds and shepherds. They were known as ayer and uh, aishir. We, uh, we have evidence for milk produce from this region being sold and these people were undertaking grain fed farming and also the system of barter existed there and we have evidence for this in the poem. In addition to that, we also get evidence for the cultivation of Tinai and Varahu, uh, which, is again, which is actually ragi crop. Marudam, uh, as I already mentioned, it is a riverine tract which was very famous for rice cultivation. The people were known as Udavar and Udathir and uh, rice was the main crop here. They produced several types of rice and perennial water bodies and the rivers supported rice cultivation. The poems describe about the beautiful rice cultivating fields like uh, Vial, Cheru, Karani and it brings out the life of the uh, Marudam land very beautifully. Neidal. Neidal is another important uh, region. It is the coastal region where people lived by fishing and also involving in trade. They were also producing salt and some of them near the Madurai, Madurai or southern Tamil Nadu coast, they were involved in pearl fishery which was traded as part of Indian Ocean um, uh, interaction. And um, we also get evidence for different groups of people. Paradavar or fisher folk were the main group living in this area. 
they were making different kinds of water crafts and then they were supporting the Indian Ocean or Indo-Roman trade. Without the support of these Paradavar who knew the coast and the coastal areas, it was impossible to undertake this particular trade and these people were playing a very important role in the trade activities. Pali is the dry region. As I mentioned earlier, this region did not have much water source except few animals here and there. So people were sometime involving in robbery or waylaying the travelers who, are, who were crossing the landscape to go from one area to another area. The people were known as Maravar. But again, we can't expect a people living in a particular region entirely depending upon robbery or waylight. It is again a poetic exaggeration. These people must have involved in hunting and gathering and also uh, other activities to a limited extent. Agricultural uh, evidence, we get a lot of evidence for agriculture. These rice uh, uh, crops were cultivated and we get evidence for this in literature as well as from archaeology. Some of the megalithic burials have produced grains of rice. We get beautiful description of different rice like Vennel, Ivananel, Thorai, Sennel and Pudunel. We don't know what exactly these varieties are but they are very interesting. We understand that people were consuming different kinds of rice. Agricultural land that is also very beautifully described and there is also evidence for converting uh, forest land into agricultural land. The Patina Palai talks about Karigala, the King Karigala uh, converting forest into agricultural land. So we get a very clear evidence here that some of the forest lands were con converted into agricultural land so that rice could be produced. Agricultural practices are also described whatever were plowing the field and they were harvesting. All these descriptions are found in the literature. Uh, in addition to uh, agriculture, there were other produce also, pastoralism as we al already saw in the Mullai region and hunting gathering and shifting cultivation in the hilly regions. All these basic produce, they contributed to the economy and the exchange and commercial activities. Craft specialization. Craft specialization is one of the important uh, aspect of the early historic society. Besides agriculture, pastoralism, crafts produced a variety of goods that could be sold across the country and they could be even exported. We get very clear evidence for various crafts in the Sangam age. We get evidence for shell working and pearl fishery. We have archaeological evidence as well as evidence from the literature. We have evidence for stone bead making and gem cutting. People were collecting stones, precious stones from various areas and they were brought to the industrial centers and very good craftsmen were converting them into beautiful ornaments. We get very beautiful graphic description about this production in literature. And also in excavation, we are finding this material. We also get evidence for glass bead making, carpentry and woodworking, pottery making, iron working, textile manufacture, gold working, bronze working and silver working. About these uh, crafts, we will be seeing them in detail with description as well as in images. Craft specialization was attained in South India probably in the Iron Age. The Sangam text mentioned about blacksmiths who were known as Quellans. The literature also mentions about potters and also we get a lot of references to the workshops where people were making different kinds of goods. Archaeological and textual sources, as I said, they shed very clear uh, light on this craft uh, production. As I mentioned, there are several crafts existed like iron smelting, pottery making and stone bean making. We get a lot of evidence for this in the archaeological context as well as in literature. Iron industry, we will come to the iron industry. We get plenty of evidence for iron smelting and they are uh, found in different areas. And But these iron smelting did not take place in all the sites. Only some select sites they were uh, smelting the iron but they were working on iron at various places. They were smelting and then they were transporting 
them to the different areas especially if you look at the megalithic burials we get lot of uh, iron objects and we can call them as ritual deposits and people did not use them at all they simply buried them and uh, deposited them but in the case of they must uh, habitation site they must have recycled and reused these iron objects so iron objects are found in a large number of uh, burials and they are found in limited number in the uh, habitations iron weapons we have lot of varieties of iron weapons like axe dagger arrowhead spearhead and knife and trident interestingly we also get their description in the literature so this particular chart shows various types of iron objects and their distribution in the megalithic burials like we have axe knives sword dagger and spearhead and arrowhead we generally people were placing lot of weapons of offense in the burial and we are getting them mostly in the burial context but in reality people must have used large number of uh, weapons or tools that are re required for the day to day activities we are not getting them in the burials what we get in the burials are selective collection of uh, Uh, implements again we get other kind of implements like sickles nails hoe and also ornaments horse stir stirrups and chisel and also bill hooks from the uh, burial sites iron furnace uh, uh, has also been reported in the early historic period they attest to the iron production all across tamil nadu and kerala here we have a an image showing the iron furnace excavated at the site of guttur again guttur has produced important evidence for iron and some of the iron have this carbon content between 2.2 to 5% so we get evidence for very good quality steel and lot of other uh, varieties of iron and they suggest that people had attained very good technical skill in the production of iron kodumanal is another important site that has produced evidence for iron smelting and also iron working this is the furnace that was excavated at kodumanal uh, this is another site where uh, we see an object iron object in situ it's a molded iron object it was found at a site called virapatti near madurai this is the furnace from the site of kodumanal these are the iron objects found in the site of uh, patanam in kerala you can see lot of varieties here iron nail and iron ring and some other objects here these are the uh, objects that were found at the site of adichanallur you can see lot of daggers swords and other weapons of offense from this particular site these are uh, uh, actually the axes you can interestingly see the comparison between the stone age axe and the iron age axe and you can see some similarities except some changes in the design so this tells us that people were creating objects based on the forms that they had earlier pre existing forms they used and created these new forms of objects again we find an interesting object this was found in kerala it was uh, uh, known as elephant goad with uh, an uh, iron object that was used to control elephant you see lot of uh, bronze objects also they also suggest that people were making beautiful bronze object and on some of the object you see animals or birds as a finial so they show the high craftsmanship of these uh, object and high quality of the production and these objects were exchanged as part of the local trade network you find them in many of the burials unfortunately they are not preserved in the habitation site because they were all uh, lost or they were recycled and used for some other uh, objects goldsmith we also have beautiful uh, gold objects from the excavation we all, uh, we also get evidence for this goldsmith in the uh, literature they, they are very clear about the gold smelting as well as gold working and ornament producing activities so these are the gold ornaments and as well as small fragments found at the site of patanam they suggest that people were smelting gold and they were making different objects 
and what you see on the right hand side is a small ornament part which looks like a Roman amphora. Definitely people were getting ideas from outside India from the Roman world about making object that is why we get these kinds of objects. Uh, again another cache of gold they were found at a site called Suthukeni near uh, Pondicherry. These objects are right now in Paris. They also suggest the varieties of gold object that these people produced. Again some more gold objects, more gold flower from the site of Suthukeni. Again a gold signet ring that was found from Karur of the same Sangam period. Bead industry, we also get lot of evidence for bead making both glass as well as precious stone beads. We get the debitage of this bead making industry in many of the archaeological sites. People were using these glass beads as well as stone beads extensively in the early historic period but we also get them in the megalithic burials. In the megalithic burials we do not get glass beads, we only get cornelian or rich cornelian beads. That shows that people had a special affection towards these precious stone beads. Here in this image we have a cache of uh, glass beads that were found at the site of Arikamidu. More glass bead tubes suggesting evidence for glass bead production and here we have evidence of stone bead production. They were cutting and they were uh, chipping and polishing drilling various materials to produce these beautiful beads. Again some more glass beads, some of them in the shape of a bird, again burial beads, some more bead producing waste that were from the site of Patanam. Cameo blanks, we get evidence for production of these kind of cameo blanks which were then exported to Rome or other region where people produce fine ornaments. Shell bangle, shell bangle production was one of the industries of the early historic period. We get evidence of these shell bangle wasters as well as fragments from many archaeological sites. Again textile industry, we also get very beautiful reference to textile in Sangam literature. Some of them talk about very thin cloth and we also get evidence for textile production in the archaeological site in the form of tanks. Textile, again it is very beautifully mentioned, even foreign sources mention about a kind of text, uh, textile called Argatic, which scholars suggest that it could have come from Urayur or southern part of Tamil Nadu and these textiles were exported outside India. Uh, trade and commercial activities, we get lot of description of trade and uh, uh, commercial activities in the literature and also archaeological evidence talks about the trade and commercial activities uh, indirectly by the presence of these materials found in the Indian Ocean region. Coinage, coin is another important part of economy. We get evidence for different kinds of coins. We get evidence of Roman coins. We also get uh, evidence of punch mark coins which were produced in North India. In addition to that, all the Chera, Choda and Pandya kings issued their own coins in the early historic period. But we do not know how far these coins were used in the exchange. But we can be sure that in some contexts these coins were used for exchange. In other contexts people were using barter system which was a much older system using uh, actually exchanging of material people were fulfilling their needs. Some of the people did not use uh, coins at all. We get very graphic description about the use of barter system in the literature in detail. Uh, local coins of Sangam, as I already mentioned, we have Panchmar coin, Chera coin, Chola coins and Pandian coins and Malayman coins. Uh, coins were known as Kasu, Pon or Kanam. Kasu was used also as an ornament. People started using coins as ornament over their bodies and some of them were used for exchange. We have evidence from the literature that the kings gave coins as a reward for the poets who wrote composed poems or for other uh, purposes. We have evidence of Kutuvan Kodai, a coin inscribed with a Brahmi letter as Kutuvan Kodai. This was found in Karur. So we have these type of coins also in this period. This is Makodai coin where there is an inscription of Makodai written in Tamil Brahmi. Chera coin, you see 
here an elephant on one side emblem of chera and also bow and arrow which is also emblem of chera and this square coin the early historic coins were square in shape we also have several other uh, local coins issued by smaller rulers this is the chera coin that was found at the site of patanam this is a copper coin again some more uh, foreign coins found at the site of karur uh, lead coin lead was imported during this period and people were making lead coins also we have evidence of chera coins in lead at the uh, site of patanam and uh, probably it occurs in other sites too we get a lot of evidence for uh, trade activities from the literature so we also have a clear evidence for uh, inland trade people were trading a number of goods inland and they are reflected in the inscriptions we have several inscriptions as well as literature mentioning about the barter of goods and also they mention about different kinds of merchants like uh, womaner or salt trader upu vanigan and jaggery trader iron trader gold trader and uh, bead trader and textile traders internal exchange system this is one of the important component of the exchange system as i already mentioned uh, internal exchange system is very important even for the overseas exchange system and we get a lo lot of evidence for the internal exchange system uh, we have different type of uh, exchanges that were in this uh, period the first ex type of exchange could be similar to sharing of resources like in an egalitarian uh, hunter gatherer society there was no idea of trade existing in this particular con context it is like giving and taking without any obligation second kind of exchange could be called reciprocal exchange where people give one thing and they are being returned another com uh, commodity this is the second type of uh, uh, exchange system so when we look at the economy we should not see that in the past everything happened in term of self cal calculation in the modern period we sell or buy things in the ancient period people had different kinds of exchanges that is what we see through these kind of uh, exchange systems we get evidence for this kind of exchange system in the tamil literature this is another kind of uh, exchange system which could be called as open barter system which in which people from different areas participated they would give certain amount of paddy for certain amount of rice this was one kind of exchange system that existed in that period the fourth type of uh, exchange system is something related to the political chiefs here the distribution of resource happens at the level of chiefs chiefs and vendors who read who redistributed their resources and who gave it to the uh, people through these exchange system the chiefs got name and fame in return so this is one way of you know shifting and redistributing the resources these are the different ex uh, exchange system that existed in the early historic uh, period uh, then uh, coming to the trade and the exchange types we saw in the previous cases like egalitarian uh, reciprocal exchange barter trade trade based on coins and trade uh, based on fixed value units and especially the kings and other people could have used coins predominantly our argument is that coins were not used by all these groups only kings and some important traders who were not from local and who were living in different contexts they needed the coins because they had to convert their profit into precious metal that is why they were using uh, coins bottle system gets a lot of reference in the literature we have reference to noduthal we have reference to mean noduthu noduthu is a term that refers to the bottle system they also mention about uh, paddy or rice being sold directly for salt so paddy and salt were probably considered of equal value we get reference to this in the agananuru text we also have number of other references about uh, buttering honey and edible roots for other product they are found everywhere in the early tamil literatures aham 
uh, when it Akhandanuru uh, poem 60, it talks about the site of Thondi. Here it mentions about Uppu or salt being sold for rice. So this also reveals that these exchange system existed in various sites across the landscape. Specialized traders also existed. As we saw earlier, we have evidence for salt merchants, gold merchants and merchants in other commodities. They were also itinerant traders who were moving from one place to another and we get evidence for them also in the early Tamil literature. Salt merchants, they were known as womener and they were selling salt for paddy or rice. We have a lot of evidence for interaction between local and foreign traders. It was impossible to undertake the overseas trade without the exchange relationship between local traders and international or overseas traders. We get evidence for these kind of exchanges in the literature. Indian Ocean trade that we have lot of evidence that was another important economic activity of the Sangam age. We get evidence for Indian Ocean trade uh, in which goods produced in India were exported as far as Roman Empire and also Southeast Asia. Similarly, goods from Roman Empire came to India. We also get evidence for this trade in several sites in Tamil Nadu. This was one of the important uh, economic activities. These uh, evidence comes from not only from Tamil Nadu but also in Andhra, Karnataka and uh, Kerala and the entire Indian Ocean region. This particular map shows you the trade routes that were connecting western parts of the Indian Ocean with India. These are the important early historic port sounds of Tamidakam which are also referred to in the Tamil literature where excavations have produced a lot of material remains. This is rouleted ware that was found at the site of Arikamedu. This was one of the traded item of the early historic period. So th these are some of the pottery that were found in Egypt. They are produced mainly in South India. They also suggest that people from India were traveling and they were trading. This particular pottery has the name of a person from southern India. His name probably reads as Kotra Puman. This particular, this particular jar produced uh, seven and a half kilo of pepper in the site of Berniki. Uh, these are some of the Roman glass fragments and originally the glass bowls must have been imported to India and they are found in the Indian sites. Again coming to the summary, so from the above account we can very well understand the Sangam age had different modes of production, agriculture existed in the riverine tracts, pastoralism existed in the mullai or in the limited tracts, hunting gathering existed in many landscapes and fishing and salt making and overseas commercial activities were common in the coastal areas. The Drey region had hunting and gathering and also people were in involving in whaling. So we get a very complex economy which involves primary production to the complex interactions. We also get evidence for craft production, production of iron and also iron working, ceramic production, copper working, gold working, shell bangle making, textile production, bead making, everything existed in different level and different scales. And many of the major centers served as a special economic zones where people could produce these objects using the raw material. The economic zones were located near the coast where they get the raw material very easily through the overseas uh, exchange as well as trade and uh, they produce lot of goods which they sold them in the interior market. That thus we have evidence for inland as well as overseas or Indian Ocean trade in this particular time period. Thank you. I hope you understood this uh, topic of Sangam age economy. If you have any doubts or queries, you can consult the e-text or you can log on to EPG Padasala website. Thank you.